Okay, we got the recording going um, now. So thank you for your feedback uh, on that first Briggs test. Uh, I'm glad to hear that it was relatively easy for most people. Um, that's that's really good. They will get a little bit harder. Um, and uh, how they limit you, I, I don't know if you guys figured this out on this first one, is you can only take the test, I wanna say three times in a day, and then it makes you wait for 24 hours. Um, so what I would do is start working on those things early. You don't want to procrastinate to the last minute and then maybe you can't get that thing passed. Um, even if you take the test, let's say before one of our class sessions here on Zoom, if you're really struggling with a couple of questions, take those screenshots and we can, um, we can discuss that during our, our Zoom class together. Um, that, that'll, that'll you know, my goal for this is to make it, you know, meet your guys's needs. And so if you're really struggling on a question, what I don't like about the Briggs system is it doesn't show you exactly what questions you miss. And I've quite frankly found some questions that maybe I didn't agree with the, their particular answer. And I've seen their answer change, like they had it right, then they did an update, and then they had it wrong, and then they had it right again. But what I've done uh, taking these tests over and over and over again, as I found that because you only need 75% to pass, uh, I've never found more than like one question I wasn't real happy with in any one exam. Uh, so that it's not enough that would prevent you from passing. It might be enough where maybe there's a bad question and you don't get the perfect score you're after. Um, Cause I, I've already learned some of you guys are, are after that perfect score, which is, which is awesome. Um, but uh, with all the tests, uh, you know, th there is enough things that are totally correct with those that they do work. Now, you might be surprised that you find misinformation in there and on a factory website. And this is just par for the course. As somebody who's worked on cars for a bunch of years, even in the car business, sometimes the factory manuals aren't right. And the aftermarket repair manuals are even more messed up. And so I look at part of the job of the technician is to be able to navigate this stuff and, and figure out, you know, what's if you're getting service information that doesn't seem correct, well, maybe it's not. Sometimes I have to go to a couple of years newer or a couple of years older and really kind of filter through it to, to kind of pull out what's real and what maybe is, is erroneous information. Um, so today, what we are going to do is three things. Um, we're going to talk about tools a little bit. We're going to talk about engine numbers and we're going to talk about engines as well as it relates to compression. I'm going to switch my screen share over to chapter three from the textbook here. And I'll put it in presentation mode. And again, I will clean that screen up a little bit more for you guys. There we go. And I won't get every slide. I'm going to hit the highlights. Okay. Now, uh, this was the book that I said would go along with our class. It's up to you guys as students if, is if you feel like, oh, I really want that or I don't. Um, or maybe I'll try the class without it. It will make answering some of those questions on the Bridge and Stratton certification tests easier. And it is packed full of good information. Um, you can see that my slides here are from the third edition. The fourth edition has some really good updates on fuel injection systems, okay? So part of working on anything is knowing the components, right? So here's our engine block. And one thing you'll find about small engines, if you're working on anything relatively modern, right? Built in the last 30 plus years, it, it's largely gonna be all aluminum, right? To save weight. If it's an engine that we're gonna hold in our hands or have to lug around, we don't want that thing to be really heavy. So we don't wanna make it out of cast iron. Um, it'll be made out of aluminum. And a great way to tell whether you're working on a part that's aluminum or cast iron besides the weight is to use a magnet. So if you get a little magnetic tool and you stick it to that part, if the magnet doesn't stick, it's either gotta be aluminum or it's plastic or something, but it's, it's a non-ferrous metal. So it's not gonna be steel, it's not cast iron. Both those things the magnets will stick to. Okay? And that's important to know because uh, as you're tightening bolts and stuff in an engine block such as this that is aluminum, you know, it's going to take a lot less torque. Like it, it can't have that, that same torque value. It's just not as hard of a material, right? Think of this engine block made out of aluminum. 
as a bunch of melted down soda cans. And so it's not a super strong material, but it is nice and light. It also transfers heat better than cast iron does. Okay. Um, last class, we talked about the, the piston and the cylinder bore. Um, I mentioned a, a term called displacement. And so here we see engine displacement. It's all about calculating the bore multiplied by the stroke. And you do this equation here and you figure out the internal size of the engine. Now, if this was a car engine or maybe a bigger small engine, maybe a V-twin or something, then you have to multiply, well, how many cylinders are the engine? If I have a V8 engine, whatever number I come up with for each cylinder, then I have to multiply that by eight to find the total displacement of the engine. A very simple way to think about engines is to think of them like a pump and the bigger the pump, right? The bigger the displacement, the bigger the pump, the more power it, sh it should inherently make. Um, a slide here on the crankcase breather. Even your car engine has some type of breather assembly. The idea is that as the engine's running, combustion gases get past the piston rings down into the crankcase. And we don't want the crankcase to pressurize. So we have to let those crankcase gases go back out. And we used to just let them go out into the atmosphere. But what we like to do today is actually draw them back into the carburetor so that we can purge those vapors. It makes the engine run cleaner. It actually helps keep your engine oil cleaner. Um, and so it's one of those uh, early smog devices, if you will, that actually helped our engine uh, do a little better. Um, so crankcase breather, a uh, system on a car, we'll call this a PCV for positive crankcase ventilation. But there's going to be some type of breather assembly on there to help purge any blow by gases from your crankcase, which is the bottom where your crankshaft is. I'll put a C on this. So this bottom of it, we'll call it the crankcase. Um, it's to purge those gases and help keep that engine oil clean. What you will find is if this hose gets disconnected or if it gets all plugged up, uh, the crankcase could pressurize and it could start leaking oil out of the side seals and stuff, making a big oily mess. So that's what's you know important about that. If you have like an oil consumption issue, it could be related to a restricted crankcase breather assembly. All right, so we talked about uh, aluminum blocks. Now your cheaper engines, the actual cylinder bore in here is made out of aluminum. However, your stronger engines, your more professional models they will put a cast iron or steel liner. And so you can see in this picture that the cylinder bore looks a little darker than the rest of the cylinder. And that's because there's a cast iron liner uh, that strengthens the cylinder and makes it last longer. It also has hardened steel valve seats as well, okay? So one of the downsides of using aluminum is it's not a real strong material and so if you want your engine to last, you're going to have to put a cast iron liner in there or have some really exotic uh, materials. Um, for those of you who have been around a while and you've heard about a car that they made in the 70s uh, called the Chevy Vega, and I can say this because I'm wearing my Chevrolet shirt today, uh, they tried to make that car with, uh, without having cast iron liners or sleeves in the cylinders. And what would happen is that, I don't know, 30, 40,000 miles, it would start smoking real bad with oil getting past the piston rings because the cylinder wall was worn. And so what would we do at the machine shop? We would bore this out and, and hammer in uh, a, a cylinder sleeve to correct that problem. All right. So here's an overhead valve engine taken apart and you can see the cylinder head with the rocker arms and valve springs and the cylinder block and it's inclined over at an angle here okay there's the head gasket this happens to be the little governor shaft coming out out of there that's an intech engine from briggs there's a good view of the crankshaft and i just thought i'd point out something kind of fun briggs and stratton uh good company they tend to love their logo so here's on the side of the crankshaft like the customers would never see this part right no one ever sees it um, sorry about that. So um, anyways, they put the logo, they stamp it into the metal 
of the crankshaft uh, on there. And it, it's funny the different spots you see this Briggs logo as you're working on the engines in spots that you would never think that they would put that logo. All right, let's see if we can go to the next slide here. So here we have some different shots of pistons. And uh, you can see that just the piston itself, you can break it down into all kinds of different parts from the head of the piston to the skirt, to the pin bore, to the ring grooves, a, a normal four stroke. So last week we talked about the four stroke engine. A normal four stroke engine will have two ring grooves related more to compression and then a third ring groove that's your oil control ring. And that package of three rings works uh, together as a group to um, control oil and blow by and give you compression. So here's, here's another shot of that. And actually your top ring is there for compression. Your middle ring is your wiper ring. And so it wipes off a little bit of oil left over. It also helps a little bit with compression. And then the oil control ring is the bottom one. Well, he, he wipes off the majority of the oil. So if I go back a slide here, go back a couple of slides where I can really see, you know, think of the, a bunch of oil is coating the cylinder walls because it's thrown off of the, um, it's thrown off of the, the crankshaft. So let me change my pen here. So I got a bunch of oil here well, I don't want the oil to get up there because I don't want to burn that oil, right? But I don't want to have no oil because the piston will weld to the cylinder and it will seize is what they call that. So when, uh, um, when you don't have enough oil, the piston literally like the rings will seize or like spot weld themselves to the cylinder board. So I need a little bit of oil up here. I just don't want too much. So the oil control ring scrapes off the majority of the oil, but it leaves just a little bit there to keep some lubrication to keep it from sticking at the top of the piston. Um, the wiper ring wipes off a little bit more oil and, le and it leaves just the right minuscule amount of oil so the top compression ring does not stick in the cylinder board. So just, I want you to realize that the piston rings work as a package to control oil consumption and to give you the compression you need for your engine to run. And there's all kinds of different uh, configurations as you can see right here uh, about your, your piston rings, different designs that allow them to work. And so these rings oftentimes are directional and you have to look for markings on them to make sure you're putting them inside the engine correctly. I've had many students over the years if they were building an engine and they didn't pay attention to this, they put the rings in upside down or in the wrong order. And either they have an engine that has low compression and or they have an engine that it runs OK, but it's smoking really, really bad. OK, remember that when you're burning oil. When you're burning engine oil, you're going to have a smoke that looks more like a blue. I'm supposed to say blue gray smoke okay and i always think it, to my eyes it looks a lot more gray than it looks blue but that's how folks describe it um so piston rings are a big deal now uh that's on a four stroke cycle engine a two stroke cycle engine is a little different animal um in fact your high performance two stroke cycle engines are likely to only have one piston ring so if i look at this piston right here well, one, this one's seized in the cylinder bore. So if I get this on the camera, you can see some marks there where it got stuck and it was broken free. And um, so that, that one's seized. This is not what you want your piston to look like. But you do notice that it only has one compression ring. That's from a more high performance two stroke engine. Okay. A four stroke cycle engine is going to have not four rings, but three rings. All right. Uh, moving right along, uh, here we got a good shot of our connecting rod and our rod cap and our piston pin. And it's got these little spring clips, uh, uh, wrist pin clips, retaining rings here. What I would say is anytime you take this assembly apart, 
always replace these clips because if one of those clips comes out when the engine's running, it's catastrophic failure. It puts a big groove in the cylinder. I mean, it just damages all kinds of stuff. So that's one of the pieces you'd want to replace anytime you took it apart. Another note here is if you, uh, let's say you misadjusted your governor or you were over revving your small engine, oftentimes what will happen is the connecting rod will break. On the Bridge and Stratton website, on the power portal, you will find if you, if you kind of go through beyond the basic type classes to the more intermediate and advanced classes, there's a great video series on failure analysis that talks about this type of stuff. Um, but I've seen it firsthand, you overspeed the engine, the connecting rod fails, and then it blows out the side of the engine block. And basically at that point, everything's basically scrap metal. So uh, different types of bearings. Um, a lot of your four stroke cycle engines will just use insert style bearings, where it's just like a soft piece of metal that gets pressed in the side cover of the engine. Two stroke cycle engines, because they have less oil, because we're only mis mixing the oil with the fuel, they'll tend to have roller bearings or ball bearings in there. They need a little bit better bearing because they're not bathed in the same amount of oil that a four stroke cycle engine has. And there we can see how the bearings would support the, the crankshaft in the engine. We can also get a good view of how the crankshaft's configure it, configured in that it's got these big counterweights here that offset the weight of the piston and the connecting rod. Okay, moving right along, that's uh, ways the bearings are located inside the connecting rod. If you have a small engine that actually has bearings like this, that's all really important. And the tolerance is there. The clearances for oil and all that are very, very critical. They're somewhere between one thousandths and three thousandths of an inch. And just to give you a reference, a piece of paper usually measures out at a couple thousandths. In fact, when we switch over to tools, we'll, we'll measure that piece of paper out. Okay, there's, there's it all put together. This has the flywheel on it. And the flywheel's job is to store that energy and keep the engine rotating around and around and around. It also has the cooling fins in it. So it's blowing air over our small engine. And it has a magnet right here. I'll put north, south on this magnet that we use to excite our ignition coil and ultimately fire our spark plug. This other end of the crankshaft is the PTO or power takeoff. And that's where we get our power out of our engine um, to, to drive a pump or turn our lawnmower blade or, or anything like that. Okay. Um, and then we have the different cycles, right? Intake, compression. Um, and uh, before we get to power and exhaust, what they did here is they, they separated out. They said, hey, you got an ignition event. When does ignition happen? at the top of the compression stroke, right? Um, that leads us to the power stroke where, the, where we're get harnessing power from the engine, the piston's moving down, and ultimately the exhaust stroke. But I need to back up here. And I want to introduce you to a, a concept called the compression ratio. So this is a good slide here. If we took this uh, volume, let's say this was six cubic inches of displacement, right? Six cubic inches there. And then the piston moves up. And now it's compressed that six cubic inches down to one cubic inch. Well, we would say our compression ratio is six to one. Okay. On an older flathead engine, oh, that might be a, a, a acceptable compression ratio. As we get to more modern engines that are small engines, uh, most stuff is now somewhere around an eight to one compression ratio. Okay, your car engine, uh, if it's relatively modern, it might be a nine and a half to one, maybe a 10 to one, or maybe even a little bit higher. Why? Because it's liquid cooled, so we can get away with a little higher compression ratio. Um, it's computer controlled, so that allows us to monitor the air fuel ratio and the, when we fire the spark plug or the ignition timing better. And what we can do is compress the air fuel mixture more. Now, the, why, why would I want to do that? If I compress this more, 
when I burn it, I will release a lot more energy from it. And that will make the engine more powerful and it will also make it more efficient, okay? But you're limited by your octane rating. So if you go to your gas pump, you're likely to see on the side of the gas pump, there's different numbers, 87, 89, 91. This is the octane rating of the gas. And if you have an engine with higher and higher compression, you're likely going to need a higher octane gas than you would with a lower performance engine. And so in the car world, or even in the small engine world, you would look at your manual and, and you know, that would tell you what fuel octane is recommended to run in that engine. Related to small engines, I know our still website is still not working, but in still products, a lot of their engines are pretty high performance and still recommends a minimum of 89 octane fuel in their engines. Most of your Briggs and Stratton engines run just fine on 87, okay? So the compression ratio relates to how much compression your engine will make, but it also relates to how much performance you're gonna get out of your engine. Just as a side note, a diesel engine does not have a spark plug. It uses the heat of compression to ignite the air and fuel mixture. So diesel engines tend to have much higher compression ratios. All right, so moving right along. Uh, your test, uh, if some of the test questions might've talked about valve overlap. Remember that's when the intake valve and exhaust valve is open just a little bit. Intake valve and exhaust, they're both open just a little bit as you're ending the exhaust stroke and starting your new intake stroke, okay? And a, uh, a high performance car, like if you, if you go down to the drag strip and you listen to a lot of the, the muscle cars and stuff, you'll notice that they don't idle real well. They're real lopy and rumbly, but when they take off, they, they really sound pretty cool, pretty wicked. Well, if you have a camshaft that gives you a high amount of overlap, what it tends to do is make the engine idle poorly, but then when you give it some, some throttle, it really takes off really, really well. Um, and so if you have a high performance cam, that's typically gonna have more overlap and you're gonna get that lopy idle. All right, um, two stroke cycle engine uh, is a lot simpler. There's a lot less parts, there's a lot less stuff going on. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that there's there's no valves. So there's no valve springs, there's no camshaft. Um, and there's also, we're not storing a bunch of oil down here in the crankcase. What we do on a two cycle engine is we mix the oil, oops, let's get that oil is mixed with the fuel. So we have a fuel oil mix or ratio. We might be running 40 to one. So for every, you know, 40 ounces of fuel, you would run one ounce of oil, okay? And my go-kart engines behind me on the wall, a lot of those we'd run at a 20 to one ratio. Anyways, we're mixing oil with the fuel because the, the fuel comes in the bottom of the engine. It's what lubricates the bearings on the crankshaft and the connecting rod. We transfer that air, fuel, and oil mixture up on top of the piston, then we can compress it and burn it. A two-stroke cycle engine does everything in essentially one cycle or two strokes. So it goes, I like to start this thing with it um, going down. And so when it goes down, it transfers the air fuel mixture to the top of the piston, okay? It's also uh, going on a power stroke. It also is going on an exhaust stroke when it uncovers that port. And when it goes back up, it's doing its compression and it's intaking in the bottom. So I'm gonna just get my typing tool up here. A two stroke cycle engine, it's like it does intake and compression 
at the same time. And then it does power plus exhaust plus transfer as we're transferring um, air fuel mixture from the bottom of the engine uh, back to on top of the, the piston, it's doing all those things at the same time. So that only takes one revolution, one REV, one revolution of the crankshaft to make that happen. Where a four cycle engine took two revolutions. So pound for pound, a two cycle engine is gonna make more power than a four cycle engine. The downside is it's gonna not run as clean and it's not gonna uh, get as good a fuel economy. So it's, it's just not as efficient all the way around. And it's the fuel economy and the emissions that really kill it. Uh, and that's why we're seeing it kind of phased out. But on something like a chainsaw where you're holding it in your hands, you want it to be super powerful. You want it to be light. Uh, two strokes still reign supreme because it's a lot of power in a small package that's super simple. All right. Um, so two cycle engines, fewer moving parts, less weight, but they get worse fuel uh, miles, right? Higher fuel consumption, more noise. I don't know, sometimes that's arguable, um, uh, but the greater exhaust emissions is what, um, what really hurts us. Okay. Um, so moving right along, let me clear out some of these scribbles. Um, back to four cycle engines, of course, we're going to have to have valves and we're going to have to have valve springs on a four cycle engine uh, to make that work as it does its different strokes of the four stroke cycle, intake and exhaust. And so there's some different uh, valve uh, retaining mechanisms. And of course, it can be a flathead or an L head. It can be overhead valve. And then like a lot of your Honda engines, a lot of your Hondas utilize a um, uh, an overhead cam design where they put the camshaft up here and they kind of have it in that style of configuration uh, to, to uh, with a little timing belt and everything. So there's different ways to do this, but if you have a four stroke cycle engine, you, you have to have valves in there to make it work. And that means that the camshaft, this is my camshaft right here, my camshaft sits to be perfectly timed to the crankshaft. So if I'm ever building a four stroke cycle engine, these little marks here have to be perfectly lined up as I put that engine together so that the camshaft's timed to the crankshaft. That makes sure that the valves are doing the right thing in relation to the piston in the four stroke cycle. If I don't do this, if one of these marks was over here and the other one's over there, this engine is not gonna start up and run. And on some engines that could even cause some really bad damage uh, as I'd be opening valves and having them hit the piston top. Um, so this is an important thing for our next Briggs and Stratton certification and relates to some diagnostics. That is a small engine, typically we have a pull starter, right? We're pulling a rope, something like that. So we have to not have a million PSI of compression that we pull against. We physically wouldn't be able to pull against that compression. So most of these engines will have some type of built-in compression release. So I'll type that over here, compression, compression release. In that maybe the engine could really make 100 and uh, maybe 120 pounds PSI of compression I couldn't pull that with my hand. I'd want to rip my arm off its shoulder, right? So they design a little device built into the camshaft that basically makes one of the valves, it makes one of the valves, usually the exhaust valve, hang open a little bit and bleed off that compression to help you start it. Once the engine starts running, centrifugal force acts on this little weight on the cam shaft and it makes that compression release mechanism uh, turn off basically okay 
Um, so Briggs calls this, their trademark name for this is the easy spin system. Different manufacturers will call it different names, but most all engines that are four stroke engines that utilize, you know, like a pull starter are gonna have some type of automatic compression release mechanism in order to make it so that you can actually physically turn the, pull the engine over with your arm, okay? Um, this uh, system does make it hard to get good compression readings off of the engine. Uh, also, um, if your valves are not adjusted right, uh, if you don't, if your valve clearance is too big, this system could not work and then it makes it really hard to spin over, over the motor. Here's another view of how that uh, compression release system works. It's got this little weighted tab that basically opens up the valve to bleed off a little bit of compression. Um, different designs of two-stroke cycle engines. We'll talk more about those later in our class, but there's reed valve, uh, rotary valve. Most are what I would call a piston port uh, engine where they just use different ports here to control where the air uh, is entering the engine, okay? Rotary, like what you'll find is your typical cheap, cheaper two-stroke engines are piston port. Uh, your dirt bikes and stuff are usually reed valve style engines. They have a little bit better low end. Uh, they make a little bit more power. I've only worked on a few rotary valve engines. Uh, us in the industry, we, we call these like the bologna slicer engines because they had a disc spinning around on the side that looked like a deli meat slicer that would control the, when the air would enter the engine. And it was kind of an interesting design. I worked on a few cart engines that had this. It's pretty cool. But uh, piston port is by, by far and large the, the most common design, uh, reed valves being second most common. Okay. Uh, but you notice, like, even though they call this a reed valve, there is no valves, traditional valves like this, in that two-stroke cycle engine. Okay. All right. Uh, there are some uh, like big pieces of equipment that will use a diesel engine. Uh, requires diesel fuel, obviously. Uh, it's high compression. We have to spray in high uh, pressurized fuel in the combustion chamber at the right time. That's its whole animal within itself. Um, diesel engines do not utilize spark plugs. They uh, might have some glow plugs on them that they use when the engine starts up cold, but really they ignite the fuel from the heat built from compression. And of course, uh, on your pickup trucks and stuff, diesel engines are getting really popular. They get good fuel economy, um, but they are, you know, the, especially the modern ones are pretty sophisticated on how they work. All right, and there's a couple shots of the glow plug and a pre-combustion chamber. I won't kill you with this stuff. There's not going to be a lot of questions on diesel engines, and you're not going to see a diesel engine very commonly on a smaller, more expensive piece of you know power equipment. This would be on like something bigger, like a like a tractor or something like that. Um. I'll just talk about dynos. Dynos, think of a dyno is like a Peloton bike for your engine, okay? We use dynos to measure the horsepower of our engine. Uh, at the factory, they would use these to rate this as, okay, this is a five horsepower engine or a three and a half horsepower, or this engine makes 11 foot pounds of torque. We're gonna use a dyno to test that. And we've had dynos like this pony brake style one from the early days of building engines and building building cars and that type of thing. At the college, we actually have a, a whole bunch of dynos uh, for testing different engines. Um, and quite frankly, they're, they're pretty cool. They're, they're a lot of fun to use. You can learn a lot of stuff from it, but it's not something your typical um, small engine shop is gonna have on there. But if you're ever thinking like, how do they get that uh, horsepower and torque rating well, that's going to be delivered off of a dynamometer or dyno for short. Okay. And there's electric ones. There's all kinds of stuff. All right. Um, 
the one we have at the school is more similar to this one where it's a water brake dyno. You're basically having the engine turn a water pump and you move more water in the pump to put more load on the engine to measure how much torque and calculate how much horsepower it has. There is, there is a relationship between torque and horsepower. Um, in fact, what you do is you measure the torque, you calculate the horsepower. What is one horsepower? Well, if I get my text tool going again, uh, one horsepower equals 33,000 foot pounds per minute. So it's a, it's power always has a time factor in it. So it's like, how much work can you get done in a certain amount of time? So it's really a, a tremendous amount of power, even in one horsepower is pretty, pretty amazing, really. Um, so uh, you notice that there's foot pounds in here. Torque is a twisting or turning effort. and torque is measured in foot pounds commonly. And there's an equation, horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by, so I said we measure the torque and we calculate the horsepower. This machine actually measures the torque that the engine is making. It measures the speed the engine is rotating, the revolutions per minute. And then it uses this formula to calculate what the horsepower is. All right. Um, this slide is just saying that, hey, as you go up in altitude, uh, you lose horsepower. And if you've ever driven your car up to Tahoe or something, you'll, you'll probably feel that as you go up in elevation, you lose horsepower. Um, and so that means to uh, maybe get the job done, I have to have a bigger, more powerful engine if I'm up in elevation uh, because there's less oxygen in the air to burn. I'm losing power as I go up. All right, keep going. So I do have uh, what's a torque horsepower relationship. That's what I just put on the, on the screen. Torque equals, uh, or horsepower equals torque times RPM divided by 5252. And why do we lose the horsepower as we go up in elevation? The air is less dense, right? The same reason why if you're an athlete uh, and you're gonna do a, some type of competition up in altitude, you, you wanna train in low altitude conditions because there's less oxygen in the air as I go up in altitude. So when we think of our engine running, we need heat, I'll get my text tool going so you don't have to read my terrible handwriting. Fuel, and we also need air. No. But it's not really just air because air is a mix of other stuff. It's 78% nitrogen. Specifically, we want the oxygen in the air. And we take those three things the, the fuel in the air, we add some heat to it through compression and from our spark plug and we burn it, we get a whole hot, heck of a lot more heat from it. And now we have a lot of pressure pushing down our pistons, right? Um, as we go up in elevation, we lose, we lose the oxygen in the air, we lose that air density. And so we lose power with it. All right. So um, when we think about compression and losing compression, right? A, a lot of that is related to, you know, are our valves properly sealing? If this valve doesn't seal up nice and tight against the valve seat, and so let me, let me switch this over. We'll clear out some drawings, we'll switch this over. We'll escape out of this and I'll switch my screen share back to this. If, if our valve doesn't close really tightly against those valve seats, I'm gonna lose compression there. 
the face of the valve, this part right here, needs to close tightly against those valve seats to have good compression. I also need to have a tight seal between the piston rings and the cylinder wall, okay? And if I don't have good ring seal, and if I don't have good valve seal, I'm gonna lose compression and I'll lose power from the engine. A lot of times that will also make the engine smoke, okay? So if I engine that's smoking, if I have an engine that's hard to start, um, an engine that seems like it, it just can't get the job done, it's got low power output, all those things could be related to low compression. So um, I put together a video, let me change my screen share back to our website here. Put together a video, it's on this playlist. It's not a fantastic video, but it will show you how to do a compression test. Let's see if I can find it. There it is. And of course, I got ads on my site now. Now, I don't get any money from these ads, but dang YouTube sneaks them in there. Um, Something big has come to all right, so let's see if I can planet. turn that off. We'll skip it. There's a couple of small engines. Uh, you can see that it's smoking. And I have a couple tools right here. I have a cylinder leak down tester, which is actually the preferred tool to use. But you can see it's got a fitting where you have to have compressed air. So you would have to have a, an air compressor to be able to use this tool. So that's not real practical. Um, although it is a better way to test the, the cylinder sealing. Uh, in this video, we use a compression tester like this uh, to test the compression of the engine and get a reading. So there I'm putting it in there. I've grounded the ignition. I'm getting some readings. Where could I you know, get a compression tester? Well, the nice thing about this is I could, if I just open up a new tab, I could go to my local auto parts store. So I'm gonna open up uh, good old O'Reilly's uh, here. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna search tool. Check out. Check engine light, okay, how about? Compression tester in tools and equipment. And so you can kind of see what they cost, right? So there's one right there. Now I should be able to check this thing out. Let's see here. I know I can do this. Uh, how to categories. There is a tool and equipment checkout here. Uh, where did it go? Every time I go to this site, uh, tools and equipment, how to brands. Let's see if we can search it up. Rental tools, there we go. That actually worked pretty good. All right. Uh, so all kinds of stuff. Hey, compression tester. So you could go to your local auto parts store and you could rent one of these guys and that will work for your small engine stuff. You could use this on a two stroke or a four stroke. Um, but like I say on the video, you're likely to get readings lower than what you would expect on a car. And that's because of that compression release mechanism. Okay. So what I find is if I get, can get, see what I got right there. If I can get 65, 70 PSI, I'm feeling pretty good about that, okay? But let me show you one other uh, tip real quick. Uh, the, this is the real fast tech tip on compression testing. Let's say I have a smaller two cycle engine like this one right here. Let me change my screen share so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so there we have a string trimmer engine, right? Um, a lot of folks will call it a weed eater. I do that too. 
Weed Eater is technically a brand and other engine equipment manufacturers get really mad at me when I call their product Weed Eaters. But anyways, so I have this string trimmer um, and we know that, hey, this thing has a pull handle on it, right? Somewhere there, it's going to have a little um, pull handle right here where I can little T-shaped handle and I, you know, it's hooked to the string and I pull on this thing with my hand and that's how I, I crank over the engine and get it fired up, right? Well, an easy compression test on one of those engines is to grab that pull starter in your hand and lift up the engine. If it has good compression, it should be able to support the weight of the engine from its compression and it shouldn't just burp, fall down on that uh, on that line, okay? If it just spins over really easy and the string just pulls out and it can't hold its own weight for, you know, five seconds or so, you, you don't have enough compression in that engine. Two-stroke engines um, get especially sensitive on compression. Like if you have a two-stroke that's really hard to start, it could be that it's just getting low on compression on that engine. Um, they tend to get that way when they got a lot of hours on them. If you think about how many times these piston rings are moving up and down and the cylinder walls, it's, it's, it's amazing that they last as long as they do without wiping out those piston rings. So anyways, uh, a compression test is a good test to do to determine the health of your engine. If you have access to compressed air, a leak down tester would be a little bit more accurate because it, it gets the compression, the built-in compression release mechanism out of the way. And you can really see how much sealing you have in your engine. And if I can find my leak down tester, there it is. It even gives you a scale on the screen here. If I can get this zoomed in, of course there's a reflection, but it gives you a scale of, you know, low and, and you know, so if you've got 40% leakage, yeah, you got a compression issue, okay? Why do I point this out first? I would hate to see you guys, you have a motorcycle, a lawnmower, a, a chainsaw, a string trimmer, and you waste a bunch of time working on it, putting on a carburetor, maybe a new fuel tank, spark plugs, air filters, fuel filters. You throw $50, $100 worth of parts at this thing, and it's wasted money because it's got a compression issue, right? If you don't fix the compression issue, nothing else is going to really help it much. Um, so that's one of the first things I want to know with an engine. Hey, is it worth my time? Is it worth spending a bunch of time and money on this thing? If it's got no compression, well, maybe it's just cheaper to get a new piece of equipment or to repower it, put a different engine on that piece of equipment, right? Um, if it's a valuable engine, then, I, you know, maybe I'm going to rebuild this engine, right? So all those things are things to think about. Uh, and I want to know what the compression is. Uh, right away when I start working. So I, I just don't uh, throw good money after bad, if you will. Okay, so that's our, our segment on compression. There's lots more great information in the Power Portal site. In fact, what I will do is I will change our screen share again. And I'll go back here. And um, what we will do is we will open up a different tab and we are going to go the power portal. See if it remembers my stuff. Thank goodness it does. By the way, I'm still thrashing around with still. I keep getting bounced from one person to another. I finally got connected with one or I got bounced over to uh, somebody and they said, oh, well, she handles all the schools and she is yet to call me back. So. We're still working on that. So uh, again, like I put in today's announcement, if we have to, we'll either eliminate uh, still assignments, we'll push them back, we'll, we'll figure out a way to make it work. I would really like to get the still website working though for you because it does have good info in it. So I just want you guys to know I'm continuing to work on that. If I go to the power channel, here I'm at Briggs and Stratton. If I go to the power channel and I look at different things, right? technical courses. I'm going to look at uh, compression. There's all kinds of good videos here 
they actually um, took like a video that they had made that was like 30, 45 minutes and they kind of broke it down into segments um, and split this thing up. But it's it's pretty good. It's got good 3D animations. It shows you how to do some engine work, whether you're lapping valves, cutting seats. I mean, some heavy duty engine work that quite frankly, a lot of people don't know how to do it. It, it really outlines it out really nicely. So if you're doing getting ready to do that compression exam, I would you know really recommend you watch all these videos. They will line up with the stuff that we talked about today as well and uh, help get you kind of go in the, the right direction as far as compression uh, diagnostics. And it's so important because like I said, it's the most important thing or the most expensive thing to fix on your engine would be a compression issue. So that, that why, that's why it's the most important thing to figure out if I have good compression or not. So I don't waste a bunch of time or money or parts on an engine that really has major engine issues, right? Okay, so switching things around, we are going to change our screen share again. And this time we're gonna go to this engine ID number deal. And because I'm running a little bit long on time, we're gonna hit the highlights of this thing I won't kill you guys with it. Um, I will just make sure we give you enough to get you going. So every manufacturer has their own engine ID number system. It's not like cars, guys. Cars, since like the early 80s, they have had a VIN number, a vehicle identification number, and they standardized a lot of those digits. So it didn't matter if it's a Chevy, a Honda, a Toyota, or a Ford, like the first digit of the VIN number is the country that that car was built in. They standardized that number. Small engine world out there, power equipment is not that way. Every different manufacturer will have their own numbering system. But today with the internet and stuff, we, we, we can decode those numbers. So I just want you guys to know that, hey, I need to identify, if I'm gonna buy the right parts for this engine, I have to identify what it is what year was it built, that type of thing. And so I need to look for some engines on that, or look for some numbers on that engine, I should say. So where do I look? Well, right here on this one, I get my drawing tool up here. You'll see that there's a stamping right there. If I switch this back, there's that number again right there, kind of zoomed in. And I can see that it says, model, it says type and code. So they'll say, hey, what's your model type and code? If you're at the small engine shop trying to get parts and you can look in that metal stamping, okay? So those numbers do mean stuff. What do they mean? Oh, different spots to look at the numbers here. It's on the side of the valve cover on this Intech engine. Um, if you go to the first page, first couple pages of a Briggs & Stratton manual, they will give you the secret decoder chart for these engine numbers, okay? And this is something that generally speaking, I don't care if you have a Briggs & Stratton engine, a Honda, a Kawasaki, uh, whatever, um, you should be able to Google search this out and figure out what is the decoder for your engine numbers so you can start to identify what it is, okay? So this is normally in the beginning of the manual. So if we have this number here, if we looked at its model type and code and we were given these digits, what would we have? Well, the first couple digits are the cubic inch displacement of the engine. That's that internal size calculated by the bore and the stroke. So this is 12 cubic inches of displacement, okay? Now you might be working on a motorcycle engine and you know it's a 250cc engine, that's its cubic inch displacement is 250cc, okay? That's in metric, right? Briggs is an old American company, so they list it in cubic inches. The second digit is the design series. That doesn't mean much to you, but it's one of the numbers in the code or one of the digits in the code, I should say. 
crankshaft position. Is it going to be a horizontal crankshaft or a vertical crankshaft? What type of PTO bearing do we have on there? Is it a roller bearing? Is it an insert bearing? Is there just a plain bearing on the aluminum surface? Lubrications type as well. Is it splash lube? Is it pressurized? Does it use an oil filter? What type of starter? Do I got to pull this thing over with my hand? Does it have an electric starter? That type of thing. Now, this is uh, a special number here, the type number is designed when you got specific uh, engine models that maybe have some special features kind of divides it out and then the last digits are really the ones that i like looking at because that tells you when was this thing built when was it manufactured so that's the year so this one would have been from 2010 that's the the month right this one was built in may and that's the date. So you know exactly when that engine came off the line. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch things up a little bit. And I know some of you guys, a couple of you guys already did this assignment already, which is fantastic. I'm going to change my screen share real quick to this. And I also need to actually go here sorry guys if we if i throw on my student view if i turn this particular mode on everybody and i go down to assignments there is an assignment related to looking up these numbers let's see if we can we can find this um this assignment here model type and code now when you guys do this, it won't, it will grade it right away and your grade will look bad because really I have to manually score this thing. Okay. So uh, there's handouts here that show you uh, the, where to find the numbers and the secret decoder ring for Briggs and Stratton engines. Now I also realize that a lot of you guys may be working on an engine that's not a Briggs and Stratton, right? I've been kind of going through like, what are your projects and stuff, that that discussion. And so not everybody's working on a Briggs and Stratton engine. What I would say is, hey, use, use Google and see what you can kind of dig out, okay? This is an example. Okay, I also have the presentation that I'm going over today. There's a hot link to that right there. Okay, and then there's this ID system, uh, another handout that kind of spells that out a little, maybe a little bit clearer. And it's, I set it up as a quiz. Normally this would be a worksheet that we did in class, okay? So if I take the quiz, um, it says, uh, you know, what are your, um, you know, it'll give you incorrect scores, but anyways. Uh, so you're gonna type in what your model type and code is uh, for the uh, PowerPoints. Uh, and we're doing those right now. So like if I switch this thing back to question one, let's see if I can do this, uh, screen share. Okay, so question one, here's our number. Um, you would then fill, fill this in. And of course the PowerPoint is, um, built into the assignment, or you can watch our video from class, but here's the number, there's the model type and code. So the first uh, digit here is gonna be the cubic inches. This is an eight cubic inch engine, which is pretty typical for like your three and a half horsepower, five horsepower motors. Um, the basic design series is a zero. If we kind of keep going through this numbering system, we find that this is a horizontal crankshaft, plain bearings on the PTO. It doesn't have any type of weird reduction drive. And it's got a rewind starter, which is a pull the rope starter. And remember when you let go of the rope, what's it do? It sucks back into the engine. So it rewinds itself, okay? So pretty standard uh, engine here. If I go, well, when was this engine built? Well, I'm gonna skip over that type in the middle and I'm gonna go to the code date. Okay, so I see I got a 02, so it was built in 2002. It was built in October and it was built on the 10th. Okay, so those 
uh, would be the answers for the first question. Let me make sure I'm sharing this right. For the first question here, that's what you would type in. So it was uh, eight cubic inches. I forget what the design series was. Let's, let me make sure I get my screen share going right. Yeah, it was built in 2002. So basically design series, no, the default here is splash. PTO, very tight, plain. And what was the design series? It was like an S or something. real quick. So design series zero. All right. Go back to this share and zero. So we put in all our answers. It goes we go through all the questions. Um, and then the, the, the last one uh, is to use your engine. Okay. So um, again, if you don't have a Briggs and Stratton engine, just uh, see what you can Google search and figure out, right? You can put your number up here. Uh, maybe it's a Kawasaki, whatever, and try to figure out cubic inches, or you could put it's, um, you know, uh, 125 cc's, right? But the whole idea is for you to kind of figure out what am I working on, okay? And not only what is it, but when was it built so that I can get the right parts? And sometimes it makes a big difference if it was built in the end of the year, like in October or November versus if it was built in February or March, right? There might be different carburetors, different parts on that engine based on what time of year was that engine built, okay? So that is this assignment. Let me go back right here in this presentation. It's the same one I'm using today. You will find those answers to questions one through four of course, we did uh, question one together. And then you can see here's question two, and it breaks it down, right? Um, and what I would try to do is I would just look at the number and I would then look at my decoder chart here to see if I can figure it out and then go back to the PowerPoint and see if that all lines up, okay? All right. So that's the model type and code activity. Uh, yep, I'm just making sure my screen share is working. It takes a while to load up some of those PDFs, but I wanted to make sure that you guys kind of knew how to do that. Um, it's a big deal whenever you're working on something is what exactly is it? When was it built so that you can get the correct parts for your engine, okay? Um, and it's a whole lot easier today with the internet than it used to be. I used to be digging through manuals and all that type of stuff. Okay. Um, so then where I wanted to finish up our class today is talking about some tools. Talking about some tools here. If I can get my, there it is. And we will change our screen share again. And we won't hit everything. We'll hit the high points. Um, you know, if you're doing work at home, I mean, it's always good to think about safety and stuff. Obviously, if you worked in a professional shop, they should have stuff labeled. And it's, it's a whole different thing when you have multiple people working in a shop facility together than when you're working by yourself. Um, but keep in mind that there's all kinds of consumer safety uh, things built into a lot of our small engine equipment to help keep us safe using it, right? So the blade control handle, that was something they started uh, back in the 80s so that if you let go of that thing, not only would it kill the motor, but it puts a brake on to stop the engine, okay? Now, I do want to bring this up. It's not necessarily a tool thing, but this blade control handle deal, 
I've had students go, oh no, my engine seized. So it won't turn, what's going on? It's cause the cable to this thing broke and it's actually putting a brake assembly, like a friction brake, brake shoe on the flywheel and that's preventing the engine from turning. So um, watch out for that. If the engine's been sitting, maybe that brake shoe is seized on there. Um, but that will certainly mess you up a little bit. Um, if, if you're trying to work on the engine, it'll make you think the piston is maybe seized in the cylinder when it's not. All right, we'll clear out those drawings and we'll keep moving right along. Uh, of course, you gotta have the right oil in your engine. Um, and for Briggs and Stratton stuff, uh, a 30 weight oil will work just fine. Um, you could also use like a 1030 weight oil. Uh, we'll talk more about oils and stuff later. I, I will say that if you're working even in your home garage and in your kitchen, you should have a little portable fire extinguisher because you never know what's going to happen. And usually what we're going to want for your kitchen and for your local, you know, working in your garage is that A, B and C extinguisher. Okay. Because we're not usually working with molten titanium and stuff like that. So an a, B, C, ABC extinguisher will get the job done around the house. Okay, um, be really careful guys working around uh, fuel and fuel vapors. You really don't want to store those uh, anywhere where there's flammable stuff. I don't even like to store that stuff in my garage. Um, I don't want to make any sparks near this stuff. And what you'll find is that today's cans are kind of a pain in the butt to use, but they are sealed. So that should keep those gases to a minimum. We also don't want to lay around a bunch of oily rags, right? So uh, you want to put those in a can, something that's sealed um, so that air can't get in there and ignite those rags. Um, and of course, don't run an engine inside, whether it's your car engine or a small engine, you don't want to be gassing yourself out. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a real thing. Um, it's colorless, odorless, and it will certainly uh, take the air right out of your lungs and, and kill you. So be very cautious to work in a well ventilated area. Um, hey, it's talking about uh, protective clothing. Right, it's not good to work in flip flops and stuff. I'll tell you, anytime I've tried to do something silly like that, I end up dropping stuff on my foot. I end up hurting, hurting myself. Having some gloves to work with is really important to have. Um, so I like these uh, mechanics, uh, nertile gloves that you can get at the auto parts store. You can get them at Harbor Freight Tools. Of course, you can order it online. Those are really good for working on greasy things. And the gloves like you see in the picture here are good for working on hot, hot things. But I'll tell you what I like to do is just don't work on hot stuff. Let that engine cool down before you work on it. Always wear eye protection. So a nice set of safety glasses is good to have even in your home workshop. Never use a grinding wheel or anything like this like you see in the picture without proper eye protection, okay? Um, in even whether you're working on engines or using engines, uh, be cautious of your hearing. Exposed, uh, you know, prolonged exposure to loud stuff makes you go deaf. And I've lost enough of my hearing to realize that I really need to take care of what's left. Parts washers, it's uh, a good idea to wear gloves with those and not soak a bunch of oils and greases and chemicals in your skin. Our newer parts washers, even like this one in the picture, are a lot safer to our body than the old solvent tanks of the past were, but it's always good to minimize your exposure to chemicals and stuff. I already mentioned about the shoes. We'll keep going. ABC extinguishers. If you worked in a business, any products, any chemicals you would use, they would want to have displayed properly the material safety data sheets so you could figure out what the hazards are for what you're using. Here we uh, have the parts washer up on display again. That's a, a water-based parts washer. I made some videos uh, working on carburetors with my water-based unit. Um, because it is water-based, when I'm all done, I really wanna dry off my parts. Otherwise, if I have cast iron parts, they will rust. Um, so keep that in mind with the new water-based stuff that's out there accident reports, 
Now we're getting to, to tools, okay? And part of tools is just learning what stuff is called. So we got like on the bottom here, we have our basic tools, right? Combination wrenches, box end, open end, ratchets and sockets. We would commonly call this a crescent wrench. Um, it's actually better known as a adjustable wrench as you see on the screen right here. Um, torque wrench, impact guns. There's some great like cordless electric impacts these days that work super well um, that have come a long ways with the new lithium ion batteries. And so I don't use my air tools nearly as much as I did. I use a lot of cordless electric stuff these days. And of course, you got to have screwdrivers and pliers and, and you know, all those th different things. I mean, some of the stuff you may not need, like um, tin snips and a tap and die set. Um, but a good selection of ratchets and sockets and combination wrenches and pliers are good to have. Here I got an image of some vice grip pliers or uh, locking pliers. So uh those are good for stripped off like fasteners to get get a hold of them there um if you're gonna do a lot of small engine work you're gonna want to have you know a good tool set and i find that it's just it's always good to have a basic tool set around the house um there's so many things that you can do with it even if it's just like it'll make it a heck of a lot easier to put together that furniture from ikea than the lousy little tools they give you in the kit, right? So it's always good to have a good basic tool set around the house. Um, it'll save you money in the long run, just being able to, you know, good use a good Phillips screwdriver or maybe, uh, uh, you know, hammer something into your wall or cut something with a, with a um, hacksaw here. So anyways, um, what we're gonna do is I'll clear out some of those drawings we'll get stuff going along. There are specialty tools and I'm gonna circle some of the stuff I really like. Uh, like here is a spark tester. You can get this out of the auto parts store for about 10 bucks. Um, I always like to get the adjustable ones. Uh, for a small engine, you want a pretty small gap because they don't have a real high output ignition system. This particular one that I've circled is the Briggs & Stratton factory tool. So it's got the gap set correctly. Um, makes the spark a little bit more visible than if you just put an old spark plug against the engine block. So if you have an engine that doesn't start, one of the things I want to check is does it have spark? And that's what this tool is used for. As you get to more sophisticated stuff, you might want your own digital multimeter. Okay, so you can measure the volts and ohms and amps of the system. We have plastic hammers and rubber or dead blow hammers, rubber mallets, uh, flywheel pullers. There's all kinds of specialty tools here. If you happen to be working on a flat head or L head Briggs and Stratton engine and you want to take out the valves, actually I can take them out with a screwdriver, but if I got to put them back in, I'm going to need one of these little valve spring compressors. So if you, uh, if you need this in our class, uh, maybe you're working on a flat engine and it's not just you're not just taking it apart, but you actually want to get it together. Um, again, shoot me an email because I can loan one of these guys out to you guys. Okay, so we have these specialty tools. Um, this is a leak down tester right here, right? We have these as well. And if you want to come to the school and do a leak down test on your motor, you can certainly do that. Again, shoot me an email. We can set up an appointment time. Usually it'll be like on a Wednesday afternoon, maybe it maybe a Monday as well, where we can set up a time to have you come by, bring your engine, and we'll get you tooled up and let you do that activity. Okay. Um, all right. And of course, I'll be there to help you. I won't just cut you loose uh, by yourself. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to help. So uh, what would you use that multimeter for? Well, if you're doing electrical tests, that's what you need the multimeter for. And we'll talk more about these as we get to later on in our semester as we're going over electrical systems and ignition systems. Here's that spark tester, really handy tool to have. Here's that leak down tester. Like I said, you need compressed air to make that work. 
but why do Briggs and Stratton, why do they keep showing it? Is they much ha rather you use a leak down tester than a compression tester because it's, it's more accurate. It gives you more accurate results, okay? All right, um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to change my screen share uh, once again. I'm gonna go to the main screen here and I'm going to just uh, minimize some stuff. I'm gonna clean up some stuff. Of course, I got a hundred windows open here that we can close out, but I'm gonna open up my um, document camera. There it is. I'm gonna open up my document camera here so you guys can see some stuff on my workbench here that now is pretty messy. And it's thinking about it. There it goes. All right. Oh my goodness, look at all that stuff. First of all, I would say, um, you know, having a, a notepad and some paper, important to have in the shop. I like to make a list of what I'm doing on the engine, what parts I need to get, that type of thing, okay? So paper and a you know, pencil or paper and a pen, really important to have. Now, I've already mentioned tools like having a good set of safety glasses. What I do with mine is I just kind of cut the box open so I can keep it in the box and keep the glasses protected, keep them from getting all scratched up when I'm not using them. Get that piston out of the way and um i would get a start off with a good basic tool set uh you know craftsman's a pretty good homeowner type brand uh to use let's see if i can focus that in a little bit better um obviously companies like mac this is snap-on this is Macco. These are more professional tools. They cost a lot more money. If you were gonna be a professional mechanic, maybe you would wanna invest in this stuff. Uh, as an ARC student, you do get a discount off of Snap-on tools, Matco tools, where you could buy them basically for Sears Craftsman prices. So there is a program for that. Now, I have two ratchets here. These are both ratchets. This one is 3 8 drive. This one is quarter inch drive, okay? And they make half inch drive. And so they correspond to sockets. So this is a three eight spark plug socket. You can see he snaps on there. Here is a quarter inch socket. And so usually you're gonna end, wanna end up with, the three eights is kind of your, your go-to all purpose type one. This also happens to be a flex head, which is really nice for getting into tight spots. Um, Anyways, the three eighths is kind of like the common go to, but when you're working on tiny stuff, I want the quarter inch. And if I'm working on big stuff, I want a half inch drive. Okay. <laughs> it's not just the sockets, but also here's an extension. So I got socket extension. This is like a 12 or 13 inch extension here. And that gets me away from my work. So I'm not bloodying up my knuckles, I'm not beating up my hands while I'm working on stuff. So I like to have, you know, multiple ratchet sockets, extensions, and of course sockets come in shallow, they come in deep, they come in 12 point, they come in six point. Six points a little stronger, but it's harder to get on in tight areas sometimes. Screwdriver set with both Phillips and standard. Everybody needs needle nose pliers. These have a nice wire cutter attachment in there. Here's some adjustable pliers. So there's two positions. That's good for like taking off clamps, off fuel lines, that type of stuff. Again, uh, Phillips screwdriver, here's a flathead screwdriver. Uh, these blades come in different widths. I typically don't want like to use this flathead screwdriver that somebody has been ground down because it, it never fits the screws right again, okay? Um, you really should use a pry bar for prying and not use a, a flathead screwdriver. Um, here's that spark tester like you would get from the auto parts store. And I really like this one. So if I'm testing my car, it has a high output ignition system. 
I might set a big gap like this. That's going to take around 30,000 volts to fire that gap. If I'm working on a small engine, see how it's got an S there for standard. I also like to think of it as small, small engine. I'm going to make that gap nice and tight because a small engine does not have a real high output ignition system. So it's not going to fire a big gap. But if I put the gap down like that, I should see a nice bright blue spark in there if I was cranking over an engine. All right, last but not least, last but not least here is my torque wrench here. If I'm actually going to be assembling a motor and I want it to last, I want it to run, like putting on my cylinder head, getting that head gasket all torqued down correctly, I need to use a torque wrench. So this is your most basic torque wrench. This is a beam style, and you can see that this one is set up for... If I can zoom it in here, it is set up for inch pounds. So that would be good for small engine stuff. So if you're going to buy a torque wrench for working on small engines, you don't want one that goes to 100 foot pounds. You want something that maybe goes to two to 300 inch pounds is what you want for what you're doing. Small engines use less torque on the nuts and bolts. That means it's really easy to strip stuff out if you have strong muscles. So um pay attention to that stuff if you're going to assemble your motor and you want it to run you want that inch pound torque wrench okay got my compression tester here here's that leak down tester and we'll wrap up with the last thing i have for you and that is some precision measurement this tool right here was actually pictured in one of our slides. It's called a dial caliper. And that dial caliper is pretty neat because it can do outside measurements. So I can measure my piston top, my piston diameter right here. I could do outside measurements. It could do an inside measurement. If I can get this on the screen, I could do an inside measurement here. It can do depth measurements um, and it does measure down to the thousands of an inch. Now it's usually only accurate within a couple of thou. Earlier I told you guys that, Hey, a piece of paper is a couple thousands of an inch. Let's test that theory. You can see it's zero. Each one of these little lines is one thousands of an inch. So I'm going to take my piece of paper. I'm going to put them in there and look at that. That piece of paper, if I zoom in on this thing and I focus it, that piece of paper is measuring just over three thousandths, okay? So yeah, three and a half thousandths. It goes to zero when I close it. So this one little piece of paper for my little things to do today card, three and a half thousandths. The oil clearance between your crankshaft in your connecting rod is going to be about half of that. The clearance between your piston and your cylinder bore is going to be oh, maybe somewhere between one to three thousandths. So smaller than this piece of paper to give you a reference of what we're talking about as far as clearances in our engine. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn this back to the computer. We're going to set up our uh, screen share again. And I will change the share back to our power portal stuff. Um, so hopefully you guys got some stuff out of this uh, lesson uh, today. Um, we went over uh, compression stuff. We went over some tools here really quickly. One thing about tools is you know, you'll learn a lot just by look, going to your local store, whether it's an auto parts store, it could be uh, your local tool store, um, your, you know, it could be, uh, heck, even Walmart has some tools like just looking at stuff and, and shopping around, you'll kind of learn different things. You definitely want a good selection of, you know, screwdrivers and pliers, ratchet sockets and wrenches to kind of get yourself started. Okay. Specialty stuff, like if you want to do a leak down test, you, you, can, you can check that out from me. 
uh, at the college, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to help you do that. Um, so we talked a little bit about, about, about tools and we talked about that uh, Briggs and Stratton model type in code. Remember, if you look at your screen, there is a to-do list on the right-hand side so you can see what you've done, what you need to do. You can also go over here to the calendar to um, see what's coming up in the class. And of course, here we are, we got some uh, model type and code uh, stuff coming up. Like that's why I made sure to talk about it today. Uh, the safety test, which a lot of folks have already done, fantastic job. Um, I have a little worksheet here on trying to look up maintenance stuff that kind of follows. Once you figure out your model type and code, once you figure out what you're working on, see if you can do some lookup of maintenance stuff. Usually, if you look up an engine, you identify what it is, on the website for that manufacturer, you can find your general maintenance procedures, okay? What I am going to have to do though, because the guys that still are lagging on us, they're still lagging, if you will, is I'm gonna have to blow these still activities off of here, at least for now. And I'll start having to eliminate some things here pretty soon uh, because we're running out of time to get stuff done. And I, I don't wanna set you guys up where you have a zillion things to do at the end uh, of the class, okay? I might set it up where you could do them for extra credit or, or something like that. Um, but I'll be, you know, respectful of your time uh, and balance out our learning activities uh, with your time commitment in being successful in this class. So uh, look at your course calendars to see what's coming up next. If you have questions on stuff, uh, make sure that uh, you shoot me an email and I'll do my best to get right back with you. Um, I'm not racing this weekend, so I should be able to to be right on top of those those emails and different messages and don't be afraid to email me a couple times like if i don't see the first one you know, wait about a day uh, shoot me another one um, i do get a lot of different messages as department head for automotive and so uh sometimes i you, you got to shoot me a couple of times just to make sure that i see those messages all right we'll get rid of those scribbles um thank you guys for um being uh here with me today i noticed i lost a few of you but ruth is a superstar she's still with me um remember you guys are going to get extra credit points for being here uh certainly so thank you so much uh, i'll let you get on with your your normal lives and we'll see you uh next week i got one last thing to check in the ch chat okay hey thanks tim um all right you guys you guys take care we'll see you next time again shoot me emails if you have questions on anything. So Tim, uh, Ruth, thank you guys. Take care, everybody.